Welcome everyone to today's session. We are talking about the bridging the gap and building inclusivity through collaborative research. Uh, this will be 90 minutes. I hope everyone uh, will have an engaging time during this, this discussion. Um, and really this this will have we'll have an opportunity to to talk at length with the professionals that we have on stage today um, about this this area that we are looking at, which is uh, the sort of widely acknowledged gap between the way research and scholarship from academia is understood and utilized uh, in industry. And we're going to get their professional insights on this. Um, just a few thoughts before we uh, engage this session as well, too. Um, I encourage everyone to uh, just utilize the chat, you know, when you have questions and thoughts that you feel are pertinent to this, it, it just makes for a uh, much more livelier discussion. And so, uh, again, engage the chat. Um, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to take some questions uh, near the end as well for any of the uh, the people that are on the stage. Just let us know who you want the question to be for um, and, and who we should address with that question. And so with that, um, let's uh, let's start with what I'm hoping will be just a really informative uh, and engaging uh, session for everybody in attendance. And I'll do a bit of, of, of really an introduction to this and the idea of, of this gap between academia and industry. Um, and, and it comes down to sort of this idea of, of an operative collaboration is what I would call it between academics and industry, which has the potential, if we think about it, for doing a lot of things um, such as boosting our economy and ensuring growth uh, as well too. And when we have that synergy, when academics and industry come together, um, that working symbiotic relationship, there we know that both can work together uh, to create really considerable outcomes um, in the world. And, and uh, of course, um, we've been seeing a lot of things through COVID and the, and the things that have emerged as a result. Uh, and it was, you know, both kind of looking and struggling to find um, how do we move through this, this pandemic, um, which was a rapid onset of change um, for a lot of people. And in academics, um, a lot of the research was, was being done at that point in time, which was almost like building the engine while it was running. Um, and so a, a lot of out of the, the, the drawer research was coming out. A lot of things were happening uh, as well, too. But there's a bridge here, and that's that's the the thing that we want to highlight. There is a bridge of sort uh, that when we think about this that has to be crossed for for us to have um, you know that opportunity to see those considerable outcomes happen, and uh, and there that substantial divide still exists. Um, and so, what is the problem there when we talk about academics and research with with industry? We can probably guess that much of that really rests on interactions between between those two entities. So each one can operate in the absence of the other. But what happens as a result of that? Well, for instance, in a recent report this year published last month, um, and this uh, this was really on the U.S. tech industry, um, which we know now is growing ten times faster, and so it really wins the race for high profits. But they've also talked about increasing diversity. And at the same time, that tech sector's uh, professional, managerial, and executive labor forces are overwhelmingly white and male. Um, so it's not surprising then that the field is under a great deal of pressure to diversify its labor force. So researchers used machine learning techniques along with uh, firm level data probing for employment diversity for about um, a little bit over 6,000 tech firms um, looking at over 2 million workers. And what they found was that 80% of those firms really displayed a pattern of very minimal increases when it came to diversity in the professional labor force. That's pretty shocking when you think about it. So the theory, um, theory versus practice, when you think about this, can be a challenge um, 
to this idea and a challenger to progress in, in the merging of these two industries. So for industry, there's issues around how to really understand and properly use research data, which can provide real value against so much secondary information that we know is out there. And, and so that part of it, without a deeper understanding, something like DEIB, which we're talking about through this conference, can become sort of the window dressing for initiatives. And so the disparity between academics and industry um, has kind of given rise to, to also the, the idea of the pracademic. And a pracademic is really uh, an in individual with both academic and a commercial role. And so someone who's both an academic and an active practitioner in their subject area is a pracademic. And we use this term remains close to the main definition uh, of bridging the academic and professional uh, world through practice. And I think we're beginning to see more of that appeal to the practitioner community to help start and be part of that solution for bridging this gap. But in today's session, we're going to actually get some insights on this topic from some of our experts in the room on this idea of knowledge creation and transfer and how DEIB is an imperative that cannot be missed. And so um, just uh, quickly want to mention, um, we know as part of this conference, the three centers that, that typically engage in research for the university, we have um, the Center for uh, Workplace Diversity and Inclusion uh, led by uh, Dr. Kimberly Underwood and the Center for Leadership and Education, uh, sorry, Center for Leadership and Organizational Research led by me and the Center for um, Education and Technology led by Dr. Cabricci um, are the three main focal centers that, that really look at um, doing a lot of research. And, and there has been research emerging as a result of these things. And so with that, um, I wanna take a moment um, to introduce our guests um, who are on the panel today. Um, and if we could, I'll let each of them do a brief intro of who they are. Um, but I'll start with uh, Dr. Kimberly Underwood. Dr. Underwood, would you give us a brief overview of who you are? Sure. I'm Kimberly Underwood, University Research Chair, Center for Workplace Diversity and Inclusion Research. I have been in this field, and I always hate to say this, I'm dating myself for almost 25 years in this space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I've done work in government, um, consulting, uh, corporate, um, and this is just really my space and I love doing what I love. So thank you for having me. Dr. Underwood, we're happy to have you here. Thank you for bringing your professional insights to this panel. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Krista Banton. Dr. Banton, would you give us a, a brief overview of who you are? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Dr. Krista Banton. I am a faculty member um, with the University of Phoenix. I've been with them about 14 years. Um, I am down in Southern California. Um, my area of specialties is mental health and social services. So I've been in that area for about 23 years. Um, and I currently am a practicing um, mental health clinician here in Southern California. So I do a lot of mental health care and work a lot in a clinical setting. And I also work in a community college setting with students and around mental health. Um, I also actively am engaged with research uh, with Dr. Underwood out of the Center for Workplace um, Diversity um, and Inclusion. And uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Thank you. Dr. Banton, thank you for joining us uh, in this conference today. We'll benefit from your vantage point, from your own background and experience. Um, with that, let's uh, move over to Dr. Sandra Sessions-Penny. And if you would, take just a moment and tell us a little bit about yourself. Unmute, Sandra. Thank you, technology, our friend. I am Sandra Sessoms-Penny, 
and I'm also a university research methodologist and a senior research fellow with the center. Uh, and so I have been around for a while. I'm in the zone that I want to be in. I'm retired military. I am also a retired school teacher and school administrator for all levels of public education. I also uh, work with students uh, in different classes and um, I'm happy to be here serving. I am a researcher, love the process. I've been with the university since 2009 and uh, Dr. Underwood keeps us moving with lots of research projects. So it's, a, it's the perfect place to be and now is the time for research. Well, Dr. Sassapini, I, I know of your background and some of the, the things that you're doing and, and the research you're engaged in. So we are, we're thankful to have you here for this particular session today and looking forward to your insights on the topic that we'll, we'll be discussing here. Um, I wanna introduce now Dr. Joy Taylor. Dr. Taylor, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I've been with the University of Phoenix since 2010, currently work with the Center for Workplace Diversity and Inclusion with under the dynamic leadership of Dr. Kimberly Underwood. As um, Sandra just said, we have been involved with many interesting projects. Um, I actually joined the center and the research team as an interest in um, finding out more about Black men and education is where I started. And that has been a fascinating study we've been, been focusing on and just ties back to my background in K-12 education. Um, one of my favorite things is working with Title I schools to kids who are in need, um, that need an advocate, someone that's helping to help them make um, good choices and, and have, you know, reach their potential. So very happy to be part of the research team and excited about being here today with this group. Thank you. Excellent. Another great vantage point and, and uh, just a wealth of experience. Thank you for being here with us today. And then uh, Mark Ludorf, uh, I'm going to have you come to the stage and tell us a little bit about yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Ludorf. I am a professor of psychology in Texas, and my role uh, that's quasi affiliated with the university is with the Journal of Leadership Studies. The Journal of Leadership Studies was started in 2007 uh, by Dr. Jeremy Moreland. And in 2011, I was brought on as managing editor and then subsequently moved into the senior editor position uh, at the journal. Very good. Well, thank you for being here, Mark. We appreciate it. We're going to gain uh, quite a bit from your insight as well. So for our audience, this gives, kind of gives you a robust view of who we have in the room with these particular professionals um, who will be addressing this, this larger scale question of bridging the gap between uh, academic uh, community and, and industry as well. And so a big part of this uh, we'll be looking at how you know this this sort of knowledge creation and transfer um, relates to DEIB and and it is an imperative that we we shouldn't miss here uh, as an opportunity to discuss. And so I'll start with uh, Dr. Underwood Kim. Um, you know the Center for Workplace Diversity and Inclusion Research really has sort of been the cornerstone of, of thought leadership and research and scholarship in the areas of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. That's, that's your, your area of expertise, and you've done some great work uh, inside of that area. And so as we, we start to reflect on this, this topic, and, and we're doing so as we're looking through several projects that each of these individuals have had a stake in, um, you know, I want to I want to think about this in this space as we reflect over the last few years. I'm sure you and your members have been extremely busy, but as both a scholar and practitioner, Kim, in this area, what what really has been some of the conversations you've been seeing in this space? 
Well, thank you, Rodney. And I think that, you know, we have to start with the basics of just, you know, what have been the conversations around research, right? And so one of the things I, I want to do, and I'm going to do something a bit different, right? I want to go to the chat. And I really want to talk to the audience. When you hear the word research, what's the first thing you think about? Put some comments in the chat. And we'll give our audience a chance to throw in those comments. Mm -hmm. Evidence-based, uh, we see knowledge, reading, gainful, uh, gaining useful information, some good ones there, data. So some good free association there, Kim. Yeah. Actionable. A actionable data. In-depth analysis. Right. And so, I mean, all of this is research, but one of the challenges, and it must be a lot of researchers in this audience, right? Because the one thing that we hear a lot of times from industry is that it doesn't translate right? As academia, as academics, we create knowledge that doesn't translate into practice for industry. And when we talk about this, there's been a lot of studies and a lot of work done around this divide of knowledge between, and this disconnect between both you know, academia and communities of practice. And so this is where I really appreciate, and I've been at Phoenix since 2007. Um, and I started, you know, as a faculty member. And one of the things that I appreciated was the way that, you know, we do bring, you know, our experiences and we have faculty that have these experiences and they are these pracademics, right? Because it is important to be able to get this data and you may have the best research. You've gone through the process and you've laid this out and your, your findings are remarkable, but if it doesn't translate to that business leader sitting behind the desk, that has to make some quick decisions and needs some information, then it becomes a disconnect, right? So we've been really looking at how do we bridge that gap? And so one of the things I know that the research and scholarship enterprise is focused on is really making sure that we do this research that has meaning, that we're looking at things that make a difference. And we're presenting in places where that knowledge will translate over and the right people will get that understanding of what we've done here and probably possibly use it, you know, to make decision making and strategy. So, you know, it's really important. And I know that this has been the main conversation in this space and it's been really what the focus has been for I think all of us. Absolutely, um, you know, and it makes me think about, you know, I, I know the body of, of your work and, and especially how it really took off even more so during the onset of the pandemic and through the pandemic, because you saw this confluence of issues and, and some of the things that you were weighing in on with your own research um, and we saw a lot of things during this time. We saw, you know, um, issues with police and social injustices and inequities and and people struggling with change and all of those kind of things. So I know that you were personally uh, from from uh, working with you that you were connected to industry. So as a, a leading researcher in this area, really, how have you worked with industry to address some of these issues that we saw? kind of come about? I mean, first and foremost, Rodney, uh, partnership is critical, right? And yeah. when we talk about these partnerships, really being able to make those connections within the industry to go in and solve the problems that need to be solved. As a researcher, if I'm only sitting on this side in academia, 
then therefore I may go and do, you know, this this hunt within existing research and say, hey, here's a problem. You yeah. know, there's a gap here and I'll work on this. But how do I know that it is a problem within industry? How do I know there's still something that is needed and necessary? We have to, I think, as researchers really begin talking a bit more to industry. You know, what do you need? What are your needs here? We see it and we do a lot of research from things that emerge from society. Um, I remember a project I did, a research project where I was in um, Ferguson mm-hmm. um, back when the police killing happened in Ferguson around uh, Mr. Brown and then went to Cleveland. I was in New York, Baltimore around Freddie Gray, looking at specifically one of the things I wanted to know, and it's interesting how, you know, all of this bubbles up from just society, wanting to look at specifically how schools were impacted and how our kids were impacted as, you know, this was going on in this police violence against, you know, people of color. And specifically at that time, we were seeing a lot of black males, Sure. right? What was that impact on our kids. And so going in when it was happening, being able to go into the schools, talk to the teachers, what's going on with you, what's going on with your students, and being able to gauge that really I was able from that project to inform, you know, education. This is what has been going on. It put me into spaces that I never thought I would be in. You know, the American Educational Research Association. Well, that's if we talk about tier one, that's tier one, right? As far as research. So and research conferences and being able to not only present at conferences, but to have those conversations with principals, superintendents. Um, People have reached out to me proactively because they found my work somewhere. And so it puts us in a place of really being able to inform industry, inform these places. Um, Another study, one that I worked on was looking at Fortune 500s, right? And so thinking about Fortune 500s and specifically, this came about simply because I was nosy and I was reading a magazine one day, right? I was reading Money Magazine and there was this best for diversity list and they had all these companies listed as best for diversity. And so I, I like to read to the end. And at the very end, it said, these companies have self nominated and provided information. I'm like, okay, well says who, (laughs) you know, and I looked at another magazine, same thing, looked at diversity Inc, same thing. And from that, I was able to go into some of these Fortune 500 companies. And if I put their names in here, everybody would know who they were. And they allowed me to come in. And they allowed me to talk to their new new employees. Were they, just, were they receptive, Kim, to, or were they, they sort, of, sort of a hunger for what you were doing in the research you were doing? So it's interesting, right? Because when we talk about being best for diversity, you know, it's like, what is she going to find? So I contacted 48 companies Wow. that were cross-listed on these lists. Mm-hmm. Four. Let me in, right? Right. But, you know, being able to, you know, talk to their HR people, talk to their managers, but most important, getting that view from the lens of their new employees. How do they learn about diversity and what is influential to them understanding what those boundaries are, right? And from that, really coming up with this great, first and foremost, a concept, organizational diversity socialization. How do folk understand DEI within organizations? That's mine. Anybody uses it in the world, you have to put underwood behind it, right? (laughs) So, you know, but also understanding. And one of the things that it challenged my own personal belief, because I always thought that, you know, a lot of this came from the top. You know, when we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, you know, a lot of this, the importance was, you know, we got to start top down. We got to start top down. The top is most important. 
uh, well, my research and talking to these new employees, and it was several, you know, they said it was their frontline managers that really defined, you know, how they behaved and what they went along with. Right. And so looking at where we spend billions of dollars each year in DEI training employees, maybe we need to start training some of these frontline managers. Right. Yeah. So it was interesting to be able to go in and do stuff that mattered and then going back to these companies and saying and they were very open and receptive. Here's what I found being able to present to their leadership. You know, this is what I found, and this is what you can do moving forward. Right. And so, therefore, you know, really excited about the the research that is being presented today, because specifically, you know, these projects were selected because number one, they focused on somewhere in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and two, they were done in some type of collaboration, but then also three they were able in some way to inform communities of practice. And I felt that between those three, it was really important. And so, you know, really wanting to start with, and today for those of you in the audience, we will focus on four major projects. But knowing that the first one is, was one that was done with the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And so with this, and one of the things that I will always do as I'm speaking, I will provide you all with a link to um, the actual documents um, as I have them. And so sending a document here, the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce was a partnership between University of Phoenix and this organization. And specifically what was happening was, you know, we had, this was done right after the onset of the pandemic. And we were pretty much maybe a year and a half out. And the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce was really interested in now what is the, you know, status in the state of work within the state of Arizona. And so had this wonderful ability to partner with them and through this partnership, I was able to do research with a wonderful um, guy, Mike Slavin. And I can't remember where he's at. He's overseas, though. And um, Mike and I did this research and we talked to leaders within major organizations in Arizona to look at how they were handling um, the situation with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then getting some of their recommendations for other organizations that may be looking at DEI. And remember, for those of you, you know, who were here either on day one or day two, you know, I said that at some point in time, diversity, equity, and inclusion was put on that back burner for a moment. And so now that we're bringing it back and we're considering what work looks like in this new normal, it was important to get some type of context around what was being done and what was working well for these organizations. And so the six main points that came out of this was, you know, first and foremost, you have to create a big business case for DEI. We can't just do food, fun, and festivals and call it a day. You know, there has to be a reason behind it. You want to be able to get buy-in from your employees on these initiatives. So you have to start building the business case and you have to live by that business case. Um, the second point that came up, and we talked a lot about this yesterday, was leading through inclusive leadership. Mm -hmm. That humanistic type of leader you know, that considers their people, they recognize their bias, they realize where they sure. may have challenges, mm -hmm. they're able to really support their folk and look at, and, and be equitable and emotionally intelligent. Um, the third point was creating a culture of continuous improvement. And what that simply means is we're not perfect. In the space of DEI, DEIB, we are not perfect. We all, as individuals and organizations, 
have room for improvement. And so making sure that you are engaging in strategy and you're looking at this strategically to continually continuously improve your organization. And then that fourth one was moving from inclusivity to belonging. Companies and organizations before the onset of this pandemic, we were right at that point of where, you know, everybody was talking about being inclusive and this is inclusivity. And, you know, these are our strategies and actions that create this inclusive environment. And that's definitely good. I don't knock that at all, but moving one step to belonging. And this goes back to you have all of these practices and policies and initiatives in place and strategies. Are you going back through survey, surveying, evaluation, assessment, benchmarking? Are you looking at your initiatives through the lens of your employees and letting your employees speak in a safe place where you understand what's working and what's not? Um, The fifth point was infusing DEIB into the DNA of your organization. A lot of times we have a diversity officer. We may have an office of diversity. DEIB is every single employee's responsibility. Kim, was there anything surprising that that you saw in the outcomes that you didn't expect? Or was it mostly what you thought you might find? You know, one of the things that I really didn't expect, and knowing who these companies were, I did not expect that they would be at such different points. Okay. As far as a spectrum on where they were, as far as their DEI, you know, journey. So, you know, some were just, you know, in the beginning, a few, you know, most were kind of in the middle and they had done some things, but they knew they had a way to go. And then there were some that were very advanced, okay. you know, in the process. And so, you know, we think just because we have DEIB, as an initiative, we have DEIB as a strategy, that doesn't necessarily mean there's advancement there. Uh And so there's always work to do. And then finally, Rodney, that that sixth point was, and it was important, Mm -hmm. was impacting the ecosystem. We talk about DEIB internally, but how are we looking outward? as far as consumers, as far as community. And one of the things that they talked about a lot was how, you know, community was now holding their feet to the fire. You know, we had had the um, summer of inequality and that that the whole thing around um, George Floyd, (laughs) excuse me, and those protests. And so therefore, You know, we also had combined with that and compiled with that, you know, the issues of politics and the issues of inequities around the pandemic. And so, you know, community was holding them accountable. You know, not only are you saying that you are inclusive, but now let's look at, you know, who are you colluding with? You know, who are your partners? You know, are they inclusive? And it put a bigger amount of responsibility there. Very good. I, I, I think there were a lot of, of really important results that came from that, that particular um, endeavor with the chamber. And with that, I want to keep Dr. Underwood up on stage and bring Joy to the stage so we can talk a little bit about the next project in this sequence that we're exploring, which was in Soy. And having some knowledge of that, you know, in SOI, the National Network of State Teachers um, of the Year, it had really, um, I remember, you know, thinking about the length of that project, uh, Kim, and that, that was uh, over probably a year. And I know that had led into the 100 Black Male Educators Speak project. So, um, which again, this is sometimes what happens with research, it can fold into. Um, yet another, um, you know, aspect of it. 
But Joy, you know, bring us up to speed on on you know this particular project and and really you know some of its its initiatives and, and history and 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 the importance of that collaboration inside of that. And this is really divided into two phases. So Dr. Underwood was going to start with phase one, and then I'll I'll jump okay. in with phase two. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because this came specifically through a collaboration internally. Oh, okay. And it was a collaboration between myself and College of Education. And then through this, Instoy had asked us to partner to do a white paper. And I apologize. These um, cherry blossoms are in bloom. And they That's okay. Me, right? yeah. uh, <laughs> Allergies. Uh... <laughs> Somebody in the audience throw a claret in this way, right? That's okay. You know, it happens every so often. I know the allergies here in Texas are bad. So, oh, yeah. So, you know, this started with partnership um, in Stoy College of Education and the Research Center. And what we were looking at was really there was little known about this trajectory of the black male educator. And for those, Come on, help me out in the chat. What percentage of black males do you think make up our teaching population? It's a very good question. Very Let's see what our audience has to say on that. Just guesstimating, what would you say based on Dr. Underwood's question? I see a 10%, 15 two, one, three, 15, five, two, eight. All right, good guesses. At the time we started this project, it was at 2%. Wow. And keep in mind that number is decreasing, decreasing. right? And so with less than, now less than 2% of black males in education, in teaching, what were the needs there? What were those experiences? So we started phase one with a cohort of, and Joy, help me out. How many was it, 12? Yes. Um, 12 fellows from Instoy, mm -hmm. and we followed them for a year mm -hmm. and really detailed their experiences um, as they met together as this collective cohort, you know, what were those conversations? And then we were able to gauge an understand, understanding and develop a white paper. But then also from that, once we did the white paper, we felt that it wasn't enough. As we did this white paper, and I will definitely put the white paper in the chat. As we did the white paper, one of the things we realized was that that voice and the lens of the black male wasn't in the research when it came to their actual day-to-day -day lived experiences wow. in K through 12. And so that brought us to the 100 Black Male Educator Project. And from there, we were able to do this extraordinary research and looked at hitting on 100 Black males and talking to and trying to gauge and understanding of these black males across the United States and their experiences in K through 12. And Joy, I will turn it over to you. Right. Thank you. And just a comment about our in-story uh, participation. It was almost like we were a little fly on the wall and they would have their meetings and we'd sit in, not necessarily as a participant, just listening and soaking it all in and um, gaining information for the white paper. and. It was just so um, touching, I guess, as someone who has eight brothers. I had never really stopped and thought about, you know, you hear about what happens in society. You, you get stopped in traffic or all these different things that happen. But I, I had not stopped and thought about what happens when they go to work, what's happening at work. And, you know, you think of the schoolhouse as one of the safest places to be. But these were men who were saying they were going to the schoolhouse, going to work. And they were running into situations that 
fortunately, I had not experienced as a, a Black woman in education um, feelings of isolation, um, lack of support. And these were teachers of the year, state teachers of the year. So these were top-notch performers. And so it was just like, it was so moving. It was the natural next step was phase two of, let's see, let's get into this more with individual um, interviews. We ended up interviewing 31 Black male educators from all across the United States. And uh, Dr. Kim Kimberly would have to tell you how many um, invites she sent out, but that was well into the hundreds and hundreds. But we had 31 that we worked with and they got to talk with us one-on-one, -on -one, probably for about an hour, some a little longer than an hour about what are your experiences? What's happening with you in the workplace as far as why are we less than 2%? You know, what's happening here? And just to give you an idea, we had the ages from age 29 to 67. So you have people who were just getting started. You have folks who have been in the military, started a second career. Um, it was grades pre-K through 12, urban, rural, suburban um, teachers. Experience ranges from one year to 40 years. And so a really broad, um, group of participants there. And one thing, you know, we say less than 2%. One of the reasons that's so important within our study and our, our literature review, one of the things we discovered is, as of 2014, the National Center for Education Statistics indicated that 49.7% of students entering public school were white compared to 50.3% of students identified as either Black, Hispanic, Asian, or non-white. And the future projection for the year, get this, of 2022, which is where we're sitting right now, was that the white population of students would fall to about 45%. Um, the reason that is important is because it just shows us society is shifting. And we can't allow society to shift and not shift along with it because that's just not going to be productive for all. And um, representation matters. When you look at um, children of color coming to school, there's a body of research that shows that they perform better when they have at least one teacher of the same race, that they're less likely to drop out. They perform uh, better academically one of the things that could be that supports that is that that cultural connection, um, having higher expectations for them, maybe having been a black student in school and understanding what some of the barriers might be. Um, but that, you know, if a child has even just one black teacher in grades three through five, that they're less likely to drop out and they're more likely to pursue higher education. Because guess what? We can't get more black uh, male educators in the teaching if they're not pursuing that route. And so, you know, when you look at, we're looking at the majority of our students are now students of, of color, but at the time when we were doing this, about 80% of the teachers in K-12 were white and the vast majority, you know, of course, most of them were female. And so some of the things that we learned from the man goes right back to what Kimberly, uh, Dr. Underwood said earlier about frontline managers in these Fortune 500 companies, how the workers were saying, that's who kind of makes or breaks whether or not I stay. And the men in our study backed that up with, that principle carries a lot of weight as far as whether or not they come, they stay at that school. Um, are you creating an inclusive environment where they feel like their voices are heard, I can come to work, I can be myself, I don't have to come and pretend to be someone else while I'm at work. Um, are there real opportunities for me to grow or I, am I just here because it looks good on paper as we've right. been hearing this week? Does it just check a box? Okay, two black men on campus, check and check, but you're not allowing us to grow, you're not allowing us to, to thrive. And so some parts of this were we had humor, we had um, a lot of emotion, especially with people feeling that, you know, I come in and like our speaker talked about this morning, explicit and um, how 
things are happening right before our eyes and no one's addressing it. No one's speaking up for me. No one's going to bat for me. And so that causes you to feel I'm not wanted. I'm just here more for show than for a growth experience. Um, and one of the driving forces behind some black males leaving, they talked about is they're seen as tough and being disciplinarians. And they're like, well, I didn't get really come into school into teaching because I, I want to be a coach or I want to be a dean. They, many of them may have aspirations of becoming a school principal, but didn't feel like they were begin, being given the opportunity to really grow um, in those areas. And they talked about, you know, when you come to work, you can't just leave your blackness, their words, not mine, at the door. Whatever you are, you bring it all comes to school with you. It all comes to work with you. And being able to walk in a place where there's that psychological safety we've been hearing about of it's okay to come in and just be yourself. You're supported. We're going to help to take care of you. We take care of each other here. That so many did not um, feel that. And instead, it's feelings of isolation because uh, one thing that was surprising is how many of them said, I'm the only Black person, person of color in my school. And this school may have been here 30, 40 years. I'm the first one and the only one, which, you know, living in Florida and su such a, a, a diverse community, that's hard to imagine. But there are many, many school districts where our school buildings where there's only one person of color, which again, all the more reason for that principal and those leaders to make efforts to really be inclusive of them. Um, one of the things that they talked about as far as how this informs industry is a lot of talk about, you know, what we need while we're still in school, while we're still in college. Um, internships and things like that are great, but that transition period of how do I transition from being a student, now I'm a student teacher, now I'm out in the school building and all my support systems fall away. And I think um, they want to go into settings where it's more guaranteed, I'm going to have a support system. I'll have a supervising teacher who comes that I can go and talk to who's not going to evaluate me. Um, mentoring program, someone who's been through this that can help talk me through um, ongoing professional development. We know that you don't just graduate college and you're all done. There has to be ongoing professional development and merely just treat me as a professional, treat me with respect and um, try and, you know, recognizing that bias does exist, that it's okay to talk about racial things at school. We need to talk about them because that's how you work through things is by talking about them. So um, this study has just, just so, so much and um, so many key points, but those are the things that, um, that stood out for me. Dr. Underwood, did you want to add anything to that? I think you did a beautiful job covering that. And thank you so much, Joy. You know, one of the things is that we have had opportunities, you know, to have conversations with ed educators across the country, mm -hmm. as well as we have presented at several, several. conferences with this. Mm -hmm. And we're now in the process of uh, publishing the first of what we see as three different publications, um, looking at various aspects of the of the research. And so this was a huge project for us. So mm -hmm. again, thank you so much, Joy, for your work on this. And I definitely look forward to working with you and, yeah. you know, upcoming projects as thank we close you. this one out. Well, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that too. I, I think that is an amazing project in many ways. And uh, we've got Dr. Sessoms Penny joining us now for, for this next particular project, uh, the Millennial uh, Research and Scholarship uh, Project here. And we're talking about how this, this um, earlier, how this emerged, uh, Kim, from a, the Knowledge Without Boundaries uh, event, which is, by the way, part of our, our annual um, summit event that we will have in September. But Knowledge Without Boundaries was an event where we we carried it around the country and and really it was an opportunity to to engage um, students in their dissertations, but also to engage community, which we would bring in uh, leaders from the community. So I know 
you made some connections uh, in a particular community at a particular time mm-hmm. where where this kind of emerged. And so um, this this was an interesting one and, and really looking at the opportunity there um, yeah. to look at millennials and their performance in the workplace. So I'll let you you and Dr. Uh, Sessoms Penny talk about this. Uh, Rodney, this was an interesting one. And I I can't say where we were because this this um, actually was associated with a research site. Huh. But um, I was sitting on a panel for KWB and one of the panelists said, you know, hey, what are you all going to do about those pesky millennials? Ah. And I said, oh, well, um, not sure, but, you know, thank you. And it, I think right then the light bulb went off, right? Yeah. And so I reached out to this person um, a few days later and I said, hey, what are your thoughts on millennials? And, you know, this person said, well, they're this, they're this, they're this, they're this. And I said, well, how do you know for sure? right? I said, let me as a researcher come in. And they had a connection to many organizations in the state. I said, get me connected to these organizations in your state. And let me talk to some folk about how they manage millennials and their experiences with millennials. And put together the project, got it approved by IRB. And the next thing you know, we were doing research around millennials and I thought this was going to be a short project, but you know, the millennials is a huge and influential generation. And I think that this next research, and I thank Dr. Sandra Sessoms Penny, and I have to give congratulations today as well. They just presented yesterday at SHRM on this topic. So congratulations to Dr. SP and Dr. Taylor but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Susan Spinney. Thank you so much. Yes, this was a project that is still a project and there's so much going on with it that we can continue this research almost indefinitely until they age out of the workforce. And so with the millennials uh, in the workplace and how managers perceive millennials in the workplace in working with multi-general, multi-generational work groups, Uh, It has been empowering to study this um, and dig deep into what the perceptions are and compare that to the reality of how things are. And so with the millennials, we know that uh, they are a unique group. And as Dr. Underwood just mentioned, uh, we were at SHRM earlier this week to up through yesterday, and everybody's talking about the millennials and the various generational groups. And with the millennials, we know that they carry a lot of uniqueness with them. Right now, there are five generations that are predominant in the workforce. That would be our traditionalists. And right now they're age 77 and up. So many of them are retiring, but some are still in the workplace. We have the baby boomers, which I qualify for. And this work group is age 58 to 76 right now. And then we have generation X, the baby busters, And they are uh, in the work group and their age is 42 to 57 right now. And then we have the illustrious millennials, Gen Y, and they are ages 22 to 44. They are working themselves into a frenzy and bringing the rest of us along with them because of their unique characteristics because they are people of change. And then finally, we have Gen Z. They're in the workforce also. Uh, They have uh, their age is uh, up to age 21 right now. And again, they're making a, a solid mark on the work industry right now as well. So we know that in the workforce, there are 2% uh, traditionalists who are still here. With the baby boomers, they are there are 25% who are still in the workforce. And with the baby busters from Generation X, there are 33% of them in the workforce. And with the millennials, it's 35%. So this is the largest work group that's in, uh, uh, largest generational group that's in the workforce. We also know with the 
Generation Z, it's 5%. So they're up and coming. But the millennials, millennials are right at their peak right now. They are starting to see so many things. As a matter of fact, some of them are also going, are also in leadership positions where they are leading organizations. Uh, Denzing in 2016 contends that to remain in a position of competitiveness, managers are investing in enduring relationships, making relationships with millennial employees to promote a comprehensive work-life balance and team-based approaches to problem solving. It's necessary in order to remain competitive, you have got to consider the, the uniqueness, the strengths uh, of the millennials, as well as the other uh, work groups that are there, the other generational groups that are there. Uh, in our study, we asked two questions, and this was a narrative inquiry, and we, we asked two primary questions. What are the strengths and challenges of having millennials in the workplace? And there are strengths and there are challenges. We also asked, what are the tactics used for socialization of millennials? And, that, and then we broke that into two sub-questions, one being, what are some of the tactics managers use that are successful and not successful and how to socialize the millennials in the workplace? And the second question was, what are the tactics managers use to help others in the workplace adapt to millennials? And so we found some very interesting uh, data uh, as a result of asking those questions. And we talked to 22 managers from around the globe, uh, uh, we used uh, three chambers of commerce to help us with recruitment. So we are connecting with industry in that regard. And from those 22 managers, we noted that they were from a broad range of industries. They want to know, how do I use the people who work with me and who work for me? And so in doing that, we know that uh, there were people from the government, people and uh, managers in the government, managers in education, managers in food service, and again, a broad range, but those were the predominant areas of the expertise coming in uh, to talk with us. And so as we looked at the range of experiences of these managers, it was from one year to 36 years. So there was definitely a wide range uh, to consider. Uh, in doing this, again, we used the narrative inquiry. We used uh, uh, semi-structured questions, 30 minute phone call, uh, and so, uh, we developed coding, we looked at the emerging themes, and we looked at the manager's primary or predominant leadership style. And that we discovered was transformational leaders because they had to anticipate change that was coming within the organization. And so right now we've heard the question of um, the great uh, resignation and the great uh, retention. The workers, the employees are focused on leaving we discovered that there are millions, 4 million people leaving the work industry every month since the pandemic. In particular, in December, uh, January, February, over 4 million people per month. And they are leaving without having any jobs prepared for them because the mindset is different. Millennials brought in a different mindset uh, different attitudes, different behaviors. They are concerned about work-life balance. They're concerned about having working remotely from home. They're concerned about uh, progression. Uh, how can they be skilled up or skilled down? And industry leaders need to know this. They, they're concerned about being included uh, at the table for conversations. They wanna know, how do we grow from here? How do we go from here? And if the managers are not willing to have those conversations, they leave, you know? Uh, there are so many things that are drawing their interest to include uh, becoming entrepreneurs themselves, taking those skills that they've learned while in academia and other uh, learning uh, opportunities, taking them to other places, starting their own business and making, uh, making the world better for them. They want the world to be better for them. And so uh, some of the strengths that emerged from this research, uh, we know that the millennials are tech savvy. They're the first generation to embrace technology wholeheartedly. I mean, they worked around organizations and with the information that they, they brought to the table, managers realized that they could help the others in the, within the organization. 
the boomers, the traditionalists. And then too, with Gen Z rising, they realize that they can collaborate and uh, do uh, sharing, the share, problem sharing within the organization. So there was so much to, to learn. They realized that the millenn millennials had a whole lot of energy. I'm not a millennial, but I still have energy. That's infusing a little humor. And so uh, I think it's important to show that energy within the workplace and to capitalize on that with each generation. But again, the millennials, they're being prepared for leadership. They are now in leadership positions. And so we help bridge the gap in, in uh, our research by showing, by understanding what managers see, what they perceive and what is the reality. The reality is the millennials are not going away. We, uh, we, are, we have to bridge that gap in understanding each group. And again, bringing them together to resolve issues within the organization. Because competitiveness and staying alive, making money, profiting is important. But managers also realize that they have to focus on the person. The person is important. The person, you won't get anything done without the input of the, the individuals who work for you. And again, millennials are leading the way. And so the challenges for some of the millennials, uh, people said that they were uh, they had bad attitudes. <laughs> they wanted to get promoted right away. They didn't want to pay their dues. Dues, And you know who's saying that, right? Us older folks are going like, you've got to be around for 20 years. you got to earn this. But millennials don't have time to wait for that. And we have to recognize that as industries, give them what they need and we get what we need. We get retention. We get commitment. We get uh we get uh, happy workers. And I say happy for a reason, because we work better when we are happy. And I'm sure Dr. Lester would agree with that. You know, happy workers are so important. Uh, what, what managers also recognize is that it's time to teach others how to grow and how to become a unit, to support and to grow the organizational culture where uh, we all benefit. No one should be left aside. Uh, the workers should feel included. When there's a change coming about, they should be taking part in, in making the changes and designing the process of change within the organization. So the skills that the millennials have to offer are absolutely incredible. As long as you have managers who are ready to receive and support what the millennials, millennials have to offer. Managers have to be trained. I heard that earlier. They have to be trained to recognize talent and to develop that talent. Industry needs to know who's coming aboard. And the millennial age group, the millennial workers, the millennial generation, they are helping us to understand what change means. And because we've had the pandemic and other issues, uh, we know that the, the millennials are very political. They know what's going on. <laughs> they, they advocate for each other. And they're very proud of that uh, character, those characteristics so that they can help the organization grow. Um, they're not pushing anyone out because, you know, time will do that. It's a matter of learning and becoming and belonging within the organization. And, you know, I get excited when I talk about uh, them and what they're doing and what we discovered. Uh, I like that we have the door is open for more research uh, with the other generational groups, especially Gen Z. So that's what I found out. Absolutely. Sandra, that, that's awesome. I think, again, some very, very interesting research. And we're talking about, you know, a different uh, difference in generations, which I think is always fascinating when we look at a subject like this. And we'll, we'll now turn the course a bit to the last project involved in, in, in really our examination of, of this, uh, this topic that we're discussing. And we have Mark Ludorf on stage. And this, this particular uh, project with uh, the JLS Symposium uh, was a really important, uh, I think, piece for a number of reasons. Now, for those of you uh, in the audience, the symposium is actually a collection of essays um, and papers on a particular subject by a number of contributors. And in this project, there were a number of, of contributors to this. And it was really about scholarship uh, informing practice uh, was the theme of this in many ways. And, and with this, I, I want to start by asking Mark, as the managing editor for the, for the Journal of Leadership Studies, what have you seen, Mark, in relation to recent scholarship on inclusive leadership? 
Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Rodney. Uh, we see a lot at the journal, and uh, although we don't actively solicit uh, articles uh, because we are a traditional journal, academic type journal with a practical side. So I, I'm going to steal sure. the academic uh, approach to uh, the journal there. So uh, we see a lot of articles that come in that uh, provide some insights into DEIB and the opportunities that exist out there. I always argue that leadership doesn't know any bounds. Uh, if you think about leadership, uh, we are leaders uh, across uh, different roles that we have. We're leaders in our own homes. We're leaders at work. We're leaders in social organizations. We're leaders in many different venues. And that allows for people, regardless of race, color, creed, uh, to be a leader. And so our journal reflects that diversity that exists in the leadership domain. And the symposium specifically that you're looking at on the screen there is uh, a symposium from 15, our issue 15.1, which was just a year ago, uh, looking at uh, diversity leadership in different areas uh, with many of the same authors that you've heard from today providing some insights into the various areas. I, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the journal in general, because people might be interested in the journal and what we have to offer uh, more broadly. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, and I think some folks have joined us since our initial introductions, the journal was started in 2007 at the University of Phoenix. It continues to be sponsored by the University of Phoenix, and it is a traditional journal. And one of the things that we saw is that when it started, and I wasn't there at the beginning, but I got there very quick, right, uh, soon thereafter, uh, we have traditional articles in the journal. That is, this uh, type of article that is what we call a feature article. So it is one of those articles that you've all read for your dissertations and extracted the information that you needed uh, for whatever points you were trying to make. Uh, the symposium, which uh, Rodney uh, referenced, the symposium is really an extended conversation that scholars can have about a variety of topics. And this is where we capture a great level of diversity in the topics that are covered. In fact, uh, in issue 16.1, which will be out later next month, uh, we're looking at African leadership. Uh, the University of Phoenix was affiliated with a couple of symposium uh, with Lynn Devnu uh, that had women in leadership. So we see a variety of topics in that symposium uh, extended conversations about uh, leadership and uh, the diversity of the type of leadership uh, that we see there. Uh, we also added in a media component, and we see leadership in the media, and we broadly define leadership in the media, and, and we get a variety of articles, whether that's book reviews or uh, we had uh, leadership using Twitter, uh, there's a, a variety of topics there that uh, we have. But I want to highlight something because it's a, something that uh, we've added in the last few years. And that is something we call our leadership perspective section. This section, what we were seeing is that we were getting in articles that really weren't feature articles, but felt like they fit in that pracademic type of genre. Uh, except that we really didn't have a place for them. And so uh, in response to the need to provide our readers and uh, subscribers uh, some broader context for leadership, we instituted the leadership perspectives uh, section of the journal, which is a, a very practical uh, approach to leadership. Uh, Articles are relatively short, 2,500 words maximum. And the editor of that section is one of your own. Uh, Dr. Eric Bean is the editor of that section. So we see a variety of 
topics come through. Uh, leadership and water rights in, uh, I, I think it was on the African continent. Uh, there's just a, a whole host of diverse topics that come through on the leadership perspective section. Very good. Mark, I'm going to ask you one more question here. And really, um, I, you know, thinking about the symposium and, and its focus on inclusive leadership, what was there a, a desire or need to have that particular topic at that time um, that it, you were you know, we were looking at the potentials for, for um, submitting for that? Yeah, I, I think if you look at the topics covered there on the screen, you can see that uh, the topics cover the gamut of the different areas that are possible, whether education, healthcare, uh, nonprofits, et cetera, that it was important for us to uh, allow scholars to have that extended conversation about leadership uh, in these different domains uh, and the inclusivity of those uh, topics there. Okay, very good. You know, I know I had a chance to work with Kim on, on this project too as well, alongside a host of, of other just stellar uh, researchers. And Kim, you know, as the lead on this particular project, what were the considerations that you had while developing this per particular symposium that you needed to think about? That's a great question. And, you know, first and foremost, let me say, you know, thank you to the journal. Thank you, Mark, for asking me to lead this symposium. Um, and so as I looked for people, you know, first and foremost, it was looking for the academic, you know, looking for people that had the experience. And let me highlight that, you know, one of these was actually written by Jeffrey Rimes, who is a current student with us. But yet and still, you know, having that experience, knowing he was partnered with Dr. Sesame Spinney, who has had, you know, many years in K through 12, you know, looking to create those partnerships where people brought in their perspectives and experiences to create the best scholarship possible. But, you know, I want to pivot here, Rodney, because I know that you and your team uh, did one of these submissions. And let me say that I always appreciate your willingness to partner your center and my center to come together to get these collaborate in these type of collaborations and to really focus, you know, on these topics. And so really wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the piece that you did within the journal. Absolutely. I, you know, and, and it was a pleasure to work uh, with you, Kim, and, and uh, your leadership and stewarding this project was really fantastic. You know, we we took a piece of this pie, um, which was really um, around relational leadership and perspectives that we would look at um, and the key constructs on diversity, inclusion, and equity within higher education. It was fascinating through our literature review and, and really looking at um, you know, sort of being deeply immersed in what we were finding um, around this idea of higher ed and higher ed and relational leadership. And how does that all fit in with, with this uh, idea of, of DEIB that we're talking about? And I think some of the things that we, we looked at and, and what we found was really, you know, underscoring diversity, equity, and inclusion and the need for better outcomes required of, of higher ed to sort of reset as a collective industry and create more dynamic strategies that would really help supply the resources, of course, um, and, and really close some of those observed equity gaps that really do exist and, and were illuminated through this particular research and, and really highlighted as a result of the pandemic. We saw some of that um, emerge in the pandemic as well. And, and some of the things that, that we found really looking at, um, you know, the, the framework from which we found most, uh, so, you know, the majority of leaders working from in higher education, which, you know, when we talk about equity minded practitioners, um, typically using a framework that tends to guide thinking about maybe, you know, what's the inherent problem and solution. Well, that framework that's used to, um, 
you know, in that way, um, and looking at, at inequities really is, it, it often treats inequities as sort of a byproduct, as an unfortunate uh, consequence of the system and an un, unavoidable variable, which was was surprising when we looked at it from that perspective. And so, you know, this mindset change, and, and I know in the research that we found, um, Dowd and, and some of the other researchers that we pulled on for this, um, really stressed the idea that what we're looking at is an antiquated framework, um, you know, that hasn't really done a good job of, um, of doing that. In fact, it's increased um, equity gaps and in, in many ways intensified some of the issues and and really some of the continuity that we see in, in educational um, inequities when it's focused on higher education. And so when those optics are there and and what emerged from this was the opportunity to see how important relational leadership uh, becomes, you know, that opportunity to have a leader who is culturally sensitive, um, that understands situational awareness and really um, an understanding of systemic inequality really was, was the, the optics here that, that we were finding. Um, this dyadic relationship, you know, the importance of the leader to the, the people and and why that is such an important dyadic relational uh, model um, really, again, looks at, at the opportunity of something we call polyphonic discourse. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, uh, you know, a, a newer kind of emerging topic, but, but the idea of everybody has a voice, everybody has a, a way to weigh in um, on these, this kind of thing and really um, have you know a, a seat at the table with some of these issues and and you know it was interesting to see what emerged from this and what we saw was hey you know what there there is sort of this antiquated um, framework that I think a lot of, of educational leaders uh, do operate from in some ways because um, again you know it, it in some ways it, it's a an equity minded kind of model, but that doesn't mean that it's going to uh, address what it needs to, especially if it sees these things, um, you know, as, hey, th these are, um, you know, byproducts of things that are forces that that somehow, um, you know, are, are variables that we can't avoid. Now that that is, you know, one of those strange uh, elements that came out of it when it came to education, educational equity. So, I think for us, you know, the idea of the relational leader in that model was the was really the big focus um, on on what is the what does the relational leader bring to this uh, and how can they help? And that was the big part of that, Kim. Thank you so much. And it was an excellent contribution. And one of the things that I loved about this was how I think each submission individually kind of merged and we kind of morphed into this one you know focal piece but yet and still everybody had their own piece of this and so definitely Rodney I thank you for that and then finally we have Krista Banton who did some writing around healthcare and specifically moving forward through leadership. Um, definitely I've worked with Krista on, you know, many occasions. She has become a very good friend of mine. Appreciate working with you. Krista, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Kimberly. I do appreciate that. So what we did with Healthcare 2020, moving forward through leadership, we really were using, looking at, the dynamics of what 2020 meant for healthcare. Um, and I am a practitioner, so this is um, very close to my heart in terms of the struggles that healthcare was having um, and still has coming out of COVID 19 and really looking at how COVID 19 impacted the healthcare industry. And so what we did was we really called into focus some of the leadership challenges that were occurring in healthcare. care. Um, 
such as, you know, having a fast moving pandemic, um, having leaders in hospitals, medical clinics, and even mental health being ill prepared to deal with the amount of work and the amount of patients that were coming in at that time. Um, and having to scramble to try to solve a worldwide pandemic that really nobody was prepared to handle. Um, and some of the problems that we found was, of course, many, many hospitals and uh, clinics do have protocols in place to deal with um, pandemic type incidents. However, this was so unique that nobody could have been prepared for the amount of uh, trauma that we had to experience in the healthcare industry. So leaders were, because they were caught so off guard, it really, there were areas where we found that healthcare had to move forward in order to deal with what was going on, but then there's all this um, chaotic leadership going on and all of the leadership models that we had put in place that we were going to use to handle a big incident didn't work. So you, there had to be some other changes, but we also looked at how leaders, this was such a unique experience that they couldn't have prepared themselves. There couldn't have been the amount of forethought that was necessary to be able to deal with a global pandemic. Um, so some of the problems, and of course, we, we looked at some of the leadership models and how, how they could have fit into preparation to handle COVID-19, but how we did really didn't draw on those models for, you know, our own leadership styles to be able to handle the crisis. Um, and we also looked at some of the crises. So things such as not having enough PPE uh, to go around, um, manufacturers not being prepared or having enough um, N95 masks, um, having staff, not enough staff, and the staff that you did had, half of them went out with uh, COVID-19 and had to quarantine themselves. And then how do you deal with that? And of course, in the early days, not having a vaccine. So every time that your staff went to work, they were exposing themselves to COVID-19 over and over and over again. And the likelihood of them being infected was pretty high. Um, even with the amount of um, of PPE that they did have um, did not keep them, many of them, from becoming exposed. Um, and then, so we had that challenge and, um, but it also looked at inequality and we went back to issues with diversity, um, equity, inclusion and belonging and how COVID-19 in the healthcare industry really called forth and showed the amount of disparity that we have in the healthcare, um, in healthcare services as a profession, um, as an industry, as a service provider. And that what we found was that, you know, wealthier, wealthier neighborhoods, wealthier hospitals got more, had more PPE, had more um, staffing, better staffing. They had um, better quality of healthcare and, you know, areas where the hospital services were um, heavily burdened might be in areas where the socioeconomic status of the area was not as high um, or in areas where it was predominantly um, African-American, Hispanic um, neighborhoods. And what we found was that the disparity was very glaring um, during this time in terms of how, um, in terms of how we, we handled COVID-19. And um, it really did call into question. And my, our hope was in writing this, that we did give leadership a um, ideals on how to improve, obviously, how to be more prepared should this happen again, because it will. Um, hopefully not in a hundred years, but you know, it will happen again. And then what do you do? Um, yeah. but also to look at the, what we found going through this, um, and how that can be changed, um, in terms of the inequality and in access to care, 
Um, now, I live in a very rural area, and I can tell you that even from personal experience that, the, that access to care is um, problematic. However, we also cited that there's actually a cost savings to address the disparity in health care, um, and that this cost savings not only improves things for the hospital, the local clinics, the public health departments, but also the communities in which these facilities are in. Um, so that cost savings is is crucial. And you know, if we're looking at healthcare as being an or a large organization or group of organizations, um, we also need to look at you know how do we save money but also provide care. Um, and how do we prepare in addressing crisis management, really? Because we, in 2020, we didn't see a good example of crisis management occurring. Um, my hope was to also um, talk about the levels of mental health care and how the, even now the mental health industry is being burdened by, um, by the fact that everybody from healthcare providers to the community is still dealing with all of the trauma from the two years that we've experienced yeah. um, with COVID-19. And how does that translate into our future? Because um, there's not enough mental health providers to be able to, to service everyone. Most definitely. Well, thank you, Krista, for thank sharing you. that with us. I appreciate it. And I think we have time maybe for one question. Let's see. Um, if we can throw one question up here from our audience um, and look at that particular one. So um, so how to get industry to act on the research data? I've seen lots of organizations do tons of research. Research data gets shelved and never acted on. Um, Dr. Underwood, um, you can feel free to um, to take that one if you want. looks like we got you on mute. <laughs> All right. So I definitely want to open it up to the panel um, if anyone wants to respond to that. I think that um, I, I, I'll take a stab at it. I think that one of the ways in order to get um, industry to look at research is, is to ensure that people in industry are doing some of the research. So um, I know from many of these panelists also are practitioners or work in the field. Um, and, you know, I'm actively working in not only a community college setting, but also in mental health. So for me, it's, you know, making sure that the people that we include and the people that I did my research with or my paper with also are practitioners. They work in the field there, you know, and this is where you get that translation is, is when there's inclusion of people that can bridge that gap between research and practice. And then, you know, making sure that they're also included in the research and that that will guide um, how fast it gets included. But if you don't have uh, active practitioners in your research, then you need to include them and bring them in. And I really think that um, that all of the research presented today really looks at including practitioners as uh, researchers as well. Very good, Krista. Thanks for, for leaning in on that particular one. Um, are there any other comments from any of our panel on that? I, I would say once they look at how it impacts their profit, profitability, uh, that they may be inclined to do more to save their talent, to keep them from moving from place to place, and to make sure that they are providing uh, what the, what the um, workers need. Very good. Mm -hmm. And then Rodney, let me just chime in really quickly presentation is important, right? If you present this full, long, thick document, you know, where are the cliff notes? What are the main points? You know, while it is important to detail your research and we do that through our writing, also being able to clearly present and provide, you know, those main, you know, pivotal facts that are necessary and needed for someone to understand and make quick decisions. Absolutely. So being able to do both. Well, I want to thank all of you. It looks like we've run out of time today. And again, just some excellent uh, presentations, things that have been happening here. Um, 
let's see, Tandra, any, any things that we need to know about before we close this? Yes, first, thank you all for another fantastic session. And thank you to our research centers for closing out these sessions for our summit. Uh, this has been a great time. I hope that everyone is leaving this summit thinking about the ways in which they will lead through these tumultuous times, also considering the ways in which we'll break those systemic barriers that we're all working through and foster psychological safety in the workplace. I feel empowered by all of the speakers I've heard today. I feel encouraged by what you all have shared today. Uh, so I hope that our attendees are leaving with that same uh, excitement and level of empowerment. I do wanna remind everyone that we are offering a digital badge for participation in the summit. If you have joined all three days of all sessions, you're eligible to receive the University of Phoenix badge, inclusive leader, self and social awareness. Now be to, to be considered, you'll need to complete the post-summit survey provided on day three and include your name and email address. The survey will be sent from the University of Phoenix Office of Educational Equity. And in fact, I believe we'll be sending that probably in about two hours. So if you don't get it today, be on the lookout for it. We hope to get that to you soon. And last but certainly not least, Come back tomorrow because we are going to be having a career fair. We have some pretty impressive organizations represented. Kroger, who uh, actually presented our career tips this morning, will have Mayo among a host of others. So uh, come back and join us and join us tomorrow or invite others to join us for the career fair. Again, we thank you all for your time, your participation in the summit, and we wish you well.